Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to pick it up there in a moment. Paul, probably this would be one of his last uh, letters before his passing, uh, written to Timothy, preparing him, though his grandmother and mother had already taught him basically concerning God's Word, the plan of God, how to rightly divide the Word of God. And certainly um, uh, Paul kind of adopted him and he's encouraging him with this pastoral letter. And wh what he has just said in this first um, uh, four verses was, be a good soldier in God's army is what it's talking about there, meaning be well equipped and prepared. You see, a soldier is always going to have opposition. You're, that's when warfare, you, you've got an enemy there and you're fighting and you're going to get bruised a little occasionally. But a real brave uh, person never bothers with that because you know God's word is going forth. And <clears throat> so Paul is encouraging him and what, what he had said in the last verse that we completed with, when you're warring, don't get entangled with um, social things and common things of the world. Do not let that get in the way of warring with Satan. Always keep your head above that. And then we pick it up with, the, if we may, with chapter 2, verse 5, a word of wisdom from our Father. And what does it read? Let's find out. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? You must always do things lawfully. Well, by whose law? God's law. As well as the community to protect your credibility. But uh, Paul uses considerable concerning um, mastering, racing, fighting, boxing, and many other things he uses. This word masteries in the Greek language is athleo, which our word athletic, athletic comes from. It means there's only one way you can do it is to be prepared, muscled up, ready to go. That's the same way with your mind. It needs to be muscled up in the Word of God, whereby you can war with Satan and know what the outcome is. Therefore, you, can, you, you know the weapons you must use to succeed to do it legally. That's very important. As long, well, why would you want to do it legally? Just stomp them. Because... There's only one way that all governments will protect you that you would most likely be operating in, and that's to do it legally by their law. That's no big step for a stepper. But at the same time, never compromise spiritually with Satan. That is to say, this politically correctness that has been swarmed upon the people where one person can object and the majority must do without is a bunch of malarkey. You do what you want to, and if it offends somebody, tough stuff. Tough for them. You do what is right and legal, and don't worry about somebody's little uh, complaint. They're an enemy if they do. There are enemies to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they need to be treated as enemies. Period. Verse 6, to continue. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. In other words, um, the, the, if you're out doing the work, don't worry, God knows that you, you're deserving of first fruits. He's going to bless you, in other words. It's, it's the equivalent of never muzzle the ox when he's pulling the plow or threshing the grain. He earns it. Give him that part. God knows what you earn, and when you earn it, when you work for Him, 
He will always bless you with the presence of the Holy Spirit that, that some people would have a difficult time understanding the first fruits, the touch of God in your very life. Uh, verse 7, consider what I say. You meditate on it. You stop. You think a moment. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Uh, reflect on what is said contemplate, understand, and God will what? He will give the understanding in all things. Have you ever asked him to? You know, uh, he wants you to remind him of his promises. That's a promise. If you do that, it's God's promise. He'll give you understanding. Have you ever asked him considering the promise? And what I'm quoting from is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, is where God himself said, hey, remind me of my promises. We can talk about it, and then I can justify you. I can make it right. So that's the way you do. And in meditation, in considering, in thinking, and pondering upon the word, do you, know, do you understand what that is? Now, just as we use the word masteries as, as an athletic, athletic in, in the prior verse, this exercises the mind. A mind that is not exercised grows dull, distant, and uh, has trouble even thinking sometimes. This has nothing to do with, with hardening of the arteries or for some medical reason, uh, physical reason, that circulation is poor or something. but when, even then, the more you exercise the mind, even the better it's going to be. It needs to be exercised as much as the body needs exercise. Verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That is to say, this gospel that we preach, that God raised him, it was a promise long ago, the gospel, the good news, promised long ago, even, even back to Psalms 22, where, um, where actually chapter 23, the Psalm 23 is the psalm of re resurrection. And naturally 22, the psalm of crucifixion and Christ overcoming. And um, the prophets foretold this. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Well, why did he do that? So that we could have salvation. He paid the price that his blood shed for one and all times. That when you repent, you have forgiveness of sins. Don't you ever, ever let anyone take that away from you. I don't care what church it is that says, well, if you do this, you're a second class citizen. No. When Christ forgives, it's gone, finished, complete, over. Verse 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. In other words, I'm, I'm here in prison and I'm suffering as if I were an evildoer. But the word of God is not bound. These bounds, this prison is not going to stop me from sending this word of God out. Jer Timothy, don't you let it bother you either. And nothing can hold down the word of God. It's going to be taught, even, even to the point that when the false Messiah appears on this earth and God's elect are delivered up before him because they refuse him, the Holy Spirit teaches this gospel. It's not bound. It will go to the whole world. And there won't be a thing Satan can do about it as Antichrist. There won't be a thing the adversaries can say about it. Many of them will even be convinced by what the Spirit says. So God's word is never bound. And even though Paul's in prison, we have this letter. Verse 10, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In other words, um, these um, chosen ones. It's why I endure this without even looking back. I know that God chose them 
And I know it is the election that do what? That bring forth that gospel. They're, they're not just pretty people that do nothing. They serve God and they serve Him and are the first fruits. Uh, do you, you remember when Paul said this before, um, back in, um, in chapter 1, verse 9, I believe it was. I'm going to read it again. You're not going to have it. Who, who hath saved us and called us, that's appointed, called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began before the er world ever was, this was done. You know, rightly dividing the Word of God is a beautiful thing, is to be able to understand it. And what did he say? You know, study it, contemplate on it, and the Word of understanding will come to you. Why? Because Christ always taught in simplicity. It is human beings that muddy the water where it's difficult to see through it. But when you take the pure Word of God in the simplicity of Christ's teachings and even the prophets of the Old Testament, then it comes, it flows like honey over the buds of your mind, exercising that mind whereby you see clearly what it is God would have you do. Paul says, that's why I do this. And so the Word gets out. and. You know what? We're covering it right today, going all the way around the world. This one that was in prison for teaching God's Word, that Word from God still comes through and is taught from the walls, showing and documenting you can't tie God up. You cannot tie His Word up. It's going out. It's going to be understood. It's going to be received. And, and so it is. He does that for the elect's sake. And um, you see here the threefold ministry of Paul as he was first chosen on the road to Damascus by Christ himself in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, that he would go to the elect, to Israel, and to the ethnos, to the mall, to bring forth the very Word of God. And so he was dedicated, even in prison, to exercise his mind and bring this forth. What a scholar he was. Verse 11, to continue. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we, all, we shall also live with him. And so it is uh, that, why? There's no, he defeated death. And when you do die, you instantly return to the Father who gave us that right and that privilege to what? To have eternal life, immortality. That's the gift of believing. That's the gift of having faith and understanding in the Word of God, whereby you see and understand what the purpose that God would have us absorb and accomplish. If you don't accomplish it, you're not doing a great deal. An accomplishment is simply to witness occasionally when, when God the Spirit lets you know, you witness. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He, will, he also will deny us. And do you know what that means? In taking forth His Word, when you're delivered up before the spurious Messiah, if you deny the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through the Holy Spirit, which is His Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, <clears throat> to speak through you, He's going to deny you. Uh, that, that is written well. Many, you're not going to have it, but I cannot help but read to you from Luke chapter 12, verse 8. You want to know what the unpardonable sin is? You want to know what will cause Christ to deny you? Well, listen to it. This, is even, this even applies, the subject is God's elect here in this last verse or two. It applies to God's elect that know better, that know they're not going to fly away, but they're going to make that stand against the false one. 
And in verse 8 of uh, Luke chapter 12, let's, let's, let's let the word, this is, these are Christ's words. Let him say it. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. <clears throat> I'm going to claim them, is what he's saying. Verse 9, But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. You deny me, I'm going to deny you. Now here are the parameters, and this is the law from Christ himself. 10, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, that is man in the flesh, that is Christ in the flesh, if you can speak something about his ministry, it shall be forgiven him. That, that is forgivable. But, here it comes, but unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. That means when you know that it is the Spirit of God, as, as Mark 13 declares when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, that you will allow, you're not to even premeditate what you'll say. But the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God will speak through you that will convince many people it's the greatest, one of the greatest teachings and destinies a person could have, a high calling to take God's word around the world right in the very face of Satan himself. Um, and and um, naturally, if you refuse that Holy Spirit, it's unforgivable. If you know better, by that I mean if you're, now let's, let's continue on, verse 11. And when they bring you unto the synagogue, that means the synagogue of Satan, and unto magistrates, and powers take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Don't even premeditate. Verse 12, For the Holy Spirit shall teach you in that same hour, that's the hour of temptation, what ye ought to say. You know, th that is so simple. You know, with God doing it all for you, that all you have to do is believe and trust Him have your faith in Him, and have exercised your mind to absorb how the end transpires, what consummates the end of this age, and you're ready. I do not believe for one moment that one of God's elect will refuse the Holy Spirit. I know them. They have compassion, and if anything, they want to talk too much. They want to talk themselves. Rather, but they will allow God to do it. Why, it would be unforgivable to do otherwise. <clears throat> what a precious Father we have that He gives us the blueprint of letting us know exactly how the end comes to pass, whereby you know how to react. And if you, if you have that destiny to stand against the false one, that's real warring, my friend. That is putting the gospel armor on and in place, knowing that he can't harm you. Why? Because it protects you from the fiery darts even of Satan. You can believe that. It is written in that last, the, the fifth chapter of Ephesians, and uh, six, you can believe it. It is so solid, uh, that gospel armor that protects from those fiery darts allowing the Holy Spirit to control and take over, whereby God can say, that is one of my children. It's one of my elect. Well equipped, well armed, and ready to do war with my enemy, that is to say, Satan. What a privilege it is to serve God in this final generation, the generation of the fig tree, which began in the year of our Lord, 1948. Many of the prophets of old wanted to live in this generation. You do. And you have the opportunity to fulfill that calling, that election, if you happen to be one of those elect, or even making the stand by conversion, that is to say through faith believing. And, and so it is. So uh, you never want to get in that position where Christ has to deny you. You might say, well, would he do that? Well, you remember the scripture where 
as Christ returned to this earth, here comes certain of these church members. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, we've thrown out demons in your name. We have done this. We've done all those things. He said, you get out of my sight. I never knew you. Never knew you. Why? Because they're worshiping the wrong Christ. You see, there's Antichrist and there's Christ. Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't return to the seventh. You know what the Antichrist message is? I've come to fly you away. I am God sitting on this throne. Go bring all of your brothers and sisters that refuse me and let's convert them. That's when you are delivered up before the synagogue of Satan himself. God makes this all so plain and simple that you can't miss it, alleviating any anxieties of the unknown. For he puts that seal of God in your forehead, which simply means the truth in your mind, whereby you know how to act and react, to consider, to meditate, to function. To function for who? For Christ, for our Heavenly Father, because you love him, he certainly loves you. So being denied by Christ is a terrible, terrible thing. I do not believe it will happen to God's elect. It will to some, but not the election. Continuing then back in the second chapter of uh, 2 Timothy, let's go with verse um, 13. And if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If You may not have faith, but he will always be faithful. He'll always have his. He's always there. That's what this means. Uh, um, you, can, you can slip away from that throne. He will always be there. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But you can leave him. You can leave him far enough, he'll deny you. But his faithfulness is always there on repentance. What patience he must have with some people that would call him names, that would um, work against the church, just as Paul worked against it, but when he was struck down on the road to Damascus, boy, did he get it converted. But people will still do it to this day. But Christ, always faithful for the repenter, the one that will repent and come back into the fold, He's there and he's ready. You want to know where that's written? Hebrews chapter 13. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. You can leave him, but he won't leave you. Verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not after the words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers, that, that they work and they strive, they run that race to whereby they convert people by, if nothing else, setting the example of what a real Christian life looks like. <clears throat> people notice it. People are drawn to it. And what, what put them in remembrance. Do you remember in that first chapter, he said, like you take the coals of an old fire, you take a poker and you stir that fire up and new flame and new life comes into that body. That's what remembrance is. Put them in remembrance of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the very thought and truths that God places in his message, in his word, that is a comfort and a blessing and brings peace of mind to the body of Christ. How precious it is to not only remind them, but keep reminding them. Keep plowing. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yahweh's plan is written. And when you show yourself approved unto God, you study that word. And uh, that's what study does for you. It gives you that closer walk with our Father, with the Father Himself. 
and it familiarizes you with his plan. What does it mean? Always study knowing what the object is, what the, the, uh, that Christ is bringing forth, and the, the very article itself. Pay attention. Pay attention to a verb. And rightly divide that word by saying, who is this written to? Who does it apply to? And the four W's, who, what, when, and where. And that helps you rightly divide that word <clears throat> and bring you understanding. Father is good to us that he does this. And it makes a good soldier out of you, giving you the ability to bring forth that word. You know, <clears throat> you might have, a, an, I'll give you an example Many people will take 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul would teach again to Timothy and Silas. And uh, he said, I think that first letter to the Thessalonians might have confused you. No way is Christ returning until after the false Christ stands in the holy place claiming to be God. And you know what? Not really dividing the word in... The seventh verse, if I remember correctly, only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, not understanding the manuscripts, many teachers will say, that is the Holy Spirit in the church. The church is preventing the false one from coming. When much of the church teaches the very message of the false one of flying away. And they're not they're not educated in rightly dividing the word whereby the verb in that verse is transitive. They wouldn't know what a transitive verb was. But the transitive verb transfers back to verse 4 and 5 to pick up who the he is that leadeth. And naturally, he that's being held is the false one. And the one who holds is Michael, as it is well written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, until he boots him out. So you see, rightly dividing the word brings clarity and understanding when you do it God's way. Simplifying the word whereby anyone can understand, even a child can understand the word of God, if true wisdom is bringing forth the message, that is to say, for, through the Holy Spirit, the very Word of God. That's why you want to always show yourself approved, studying. Watch the subject, watch the object, okay? Watch the article, rightly dividing it. Who, what, when, where, and why. And then you've got it. That's the, the four or five W's, five if you complete, when you have those answers, you're pretty well understanding what God is talking about if you've done your homework. Verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. In other words, they're, they're going to lead you astray. Babbling is nonsense. Why, why would somebody want to go somewhere and call it a meeting and hear nonsense for 30 minutes or an hour? God's Word is not nonsense. Babbling is. And sometimes people certainly like to babble. And babble is straight out of Babylon. It's a trick of Satan to deceive people. You see, you have a negative and a positive here. Verse 15, study what? Study some man's work? Study some babbler's babbling? No, 15 says study to show thyself approved unto God. You study God's word. Not a bunch of babblings and nonsense and emptiness that brings forth and is never documented in God's word. That will, that will lead you so far off the beaten path that pretty soon you're confused that you don't even understand simple salvation from who, what, when, and where. 
Verse 17, what about these babblers? And their word will eat as doth a canker. That word canker is gangrene. It'll eat you alive. You'll lose limbs. Of whom is Hymenius? Uh, Hymenius is belonging to marriage. Why, why would he pick a name like that? And Philetus, which means um, beloved, what, what names to pick. But they didn't believe in the resurrection. Didn't believe in the beauty of life after death, defe Christ defeating death, that he didn't have that power, but he did have that power. He defeated death, and death is no longer. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So these two clowns, you don't want to go there. You know that Christ resurrected, and if you know Christ resurrected, as it is written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, if you believe Christ resurrected, you know that all those that have died in Him or that sleep in Him have risen also. Have risen also. They're with Him. Right? They're alive. Christ defeated death. Death is no longer until the... the Second Advent, which is really the judgment to the death of the soul, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, the last two verses. <clears throat> Verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, it, it isn't too difficult to confuse some people or to gain a following if you use psychology of man, which is traditions of men. You, you, can, you can pull people away. But when you stick to God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, oh, well, brother, no church can operate teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse because people find it boring. Not if you teach it, not if you rightly divide it, not if you study it. It is an insult for someone to say that God's Word is boring when it is life, it is liberty, it is freedom, it is peace of mind. You want to grow your church, teach God's Word, study to rightly divide the Word of God, and you'll have to build a bigger church. A true teacher is never hard up for students because people hunger for hearing the Word of God. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are again, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it, won't you? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. You know why we don't have to judge people? Because God is judge, and he gets a little jealous if you get on his toes. So if you ever want trouble, just go ahead and judge somebody and see what the Father does for you. You do have the opportunity and right, it's a gift from God, to be able to discern. And when you discern spiritually whether something is right, wrong, or somewhere in between, the reason you can discern is you're studied in the Word of God. 
and the Spirit leads you in that. So always know that and understand. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? We can do away with the number and the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. He's that close to you that no one can prevent you from praying because you don't have to pray out loud. They, they would never know you were praying. So let our Father know that you love Him. That, that is what He wants from you. Heavenly Father, around the world we come to you. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch. In Yeshua's precious name, amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Donna from California. Uh, and thank you for the Thanksgiving wish. You said that in the first earth age, dinosaurs were on earth because they were flesh and that people were in spiritual bodies in heaven with God. I remember you have a footprint of an angel in your drawer from the first earth age. So my question is, were people in spiritual bodies in the first earth age allowed to leave heaven to come to earth during the time of the dinosaurs? Absolutely. Uh, this, this is documented in Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning reading along about verse 18, where God tells you what he took from the earth when he brought about the catabo, the overthrow, where we have these plates split and the reason for earthquakes today and the firmament having fallen. He lets you know there were people on earth. And, well, how, do you, how does it have a footprint? Well, it was mass. They have to have transportation. That's why the vehicle is described in Ezekiel where God's altar was brought to this earth. As well as what image were we made in? God and the angels. So an angel footprint looks just like a, a man or a woman's footprint. Okay. So in the first earth age, they were in that particular body. They're not in it any longer. They're in the body of the second earth age and the second heaven age. But they could trans, uh, uh, as God would have it. And after the fall, many things happened. Uh, Andre from Mississippi. I stayed up the other night, all night, and for that I'm thankful because I was flipping channels and your program started. I long to know God, my Savior. My son, Marvin Garvin, asked me a question this morning and I didn't have the answer but maybe you do. He wants to know, when we die and go to heaven, do we remain the same age or do we grow? I really thank God for allowing me to stay up because it was very sleepy. Well, thank you for joining us. It's good to have you. When, when we are in spiritual bodies, we are all the same age as a, as a young person. Why? Because age has nothing to do with a spiritual body. Your documentation is when any angel appeared, let's say at Christ's resurrection, that when Mary and others would go to the tomb, Magdalena that is to say, they talked to angels there. And they always said it was a young person. Right? Because all angels look young, but they're all the same age. They were created in the first earth age. You were there. And, and um, in the spiritual body, sickness, uh, age, uh, nothing uh, doesn't apply. That's why eternally, that's the way you are. We're all the same age. Marilyn from Iowa. Um, I have a grandson. When he was born, his parents gave him a long name. Example, John Jacob Marantha Jones. Do you think... By adding Mariantha in the name, it puts a curse on him. This boy has been in a lot of trouble. I would hope that Mariantha doesn't put a curse on him. Do you know why? Because Mariantha being interpreted means our Lord cometh. And he's going to at the second advent. The Lord coming certainly would never be a curse. It would be just the opposite. Just because a boy gets in trouble, he gets in trouble because he's not using his head. He's not using common sense. And maybe, perhaps, he'll learn after he gets in enough trouble that doesn't pay. And he'll straighten up his act and be a man of God. 
uh, Teresa from, uh, he should be because his name so declares it, the Lord cometh. Uh, Teresa from Kentucky. Thank you, Pastor, for the clarity you've shown us. We have been taught wrong and we have, you have saved my daughter and I from so much deceit, saving our lives. Well, it, the Word did it, okay? God's Word will do that. We are blessed to hear His love letter so audibly. How long did it take you to memorize His Word? Um, wow, I want to do that too. How, how did you, how, how would you learn best? Well, about 55 years of teaching and studying, rightly dividing the Word. But no one knows all of the Word, and no one can memorize all of the Word. But sometimes God gifts us with a special recall and the ability to recall, and it is a gift from God. And a lot of hard, when you exercise your mind, it picks up, it will work for you. Uh, Joy, thank you for your comments. Joy from California. Thank you so much for everything. I'm learning so much from Pastor Murray and Pastor Dennis. You are a godsend to me. I have a question about Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. What does it mean? Well, it, it means that even those that during the Christian um, um, lives that many of them were in lion, throwing in an arena with lions, and many of them were beheaded, and, and they're going to be there. It means God's not going to leave anybody behind. Now, Antichrist is not going to behead anyone. He can't play the role of Christ and go around butchering people. And when you are delivered, he is death, and when you're delivered up before him, you're delivered up before death. Not physically, but spiritually. You can cut it, and so it is. But uh, that, that particular verse frightens a lot of people, but they're, they're, hey, it, it hasn't always been the healthiest thing in the world to be a Christian. And um, during the um, Roman reigns and Caesar's little parties and so forth, sometimes it got a little rough. Shepherd's Chapel, Andrew, age nine, from Illinois. My question is, why do some people think the world will end in 2012? Well, because of the Mayan calendar that it supposedly, if some think ends there, it ends a cycle. And um, it, uh, we have a lot of movie makers, documentary makers that like to um, maybe dream some things up. And we are in the final generation, so it's going to happen. And for nine, you're a, you're a deep thinker, and, and um, it's, it's well to question that. But always know, you know when Christ comes by the seven trumps, the seven seals and the seven vials, and as each of them play out in current events in this world age, that's how you really tell. Naturally, you need to know those trumps, seals. Seals is the truth of all seven of them going into your forehead so you know what you're anticipating. Shirley from North Carolina, can a Mamzar become a leader of his own, you betcha. There's nothing to prevent that. God loves all his children. He created every soul. Uh, Brian from Texas. Leviticus tells us we are not supposed to eat certain foods. This is in the Old Testament, and the New Testament says that foods are clean and it is okay to eat them. You're very wrong. Okay, let's see what you say. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. That, that, that's concerning holy days. Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. We just taught that. What does it say in verse 3? It says, don't let anyone judge you in marriage and don't let anyone judge you in food that God created to be received. Did you hear me? that God created to be received. He did not create scavengers to be received. They will make you sick, okay? 
And, and then in verse five down down, he'll say all animals are good. You bet scavengers keep disease off the earth. But like the swine has no sweat glands. So all the poison it eats all of its life ends up in the fat and it will make you sick. Now it's not a sin to hell for you to eat scavengers, but it is a sin to your health. And that's why he said it. Hebrews chapter seven, four has nothing to do with food. So I, I don't know what, where you're going there. How, how will, um, from, this is hi from Illinois. If all races were created on the sixth day, what race did Adam and Eve produce? They were created on the eighth day and um, the, they created the race through which Christ came. It's eth ha adam, okay? And so it, and so it is. Uh, Martha from Arizona, will we have the same parents in the third world age that we do now? You'll have one parent. You, you will know your parents, but we will only have one parent. It's our Father God. He will expect his children. There will be no birthing in that time, which uh, we do not give or take in marriage because we are as the angels. Why? Because we are messengers. That's what an angel is of, of God, children of God. And um, the reason for birth has served its purpose. It was where by each entity, soul from the first earth age could be born into this one innocent, not knowing about the overthrow from before. Being born innocent a woman, a babe to make his or her mind up whether you're going to love God or Satan. It's always your choice. It's your way to go. That's, that's what uh, this earth age is about, okay? And um, in, in the final countdown, we have one parent all, and he is the creator of your very being. That is your real parent, your closest relative, is God himself. Uh, read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, where God puts his claim out, stakes it. All souls are mine. They're his children, and he loves them. Marion from Oklahoma, where in the Bible does it teach the first earth age? And please help me understand Genesis 1.1. Well, Genesis 1-1 is pretty, it's pr pretty clear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. It didn't say when the beginning was, but it says God did create it. Verse 2 is what you're interested in. Verse 2, let me, let me quote it from the Hebrew. Tuhu va wuhu. That is to say, the earth is was not created void and without form. God doesn't create anything that's void. It became void and without form because of Satan's rebellion, okay? Uh, God destroyed it. He could have killed a third of his children, but he far rather would destroy that earth age and bring in a new one and try to save the children. And so it is, he's in the business of saving. So uh, your companion Bible, if you have one here from our library, um, it kind of explains that. And then as I quoted earlier, if you read Jeremiah chapter 4, along about verse 18, where God says, my, my children are a little bit sottish. It means stupid, okay? They don't know that once before they irritated me to the point that I tore this world up. I didn't let one town, one village, any animal survive. I, I wiped it out. And if you don't think I'll do it again, try me. And he, he does have, it's an interesting thing. And we'll, we'll be teaching that again probably before too long. Marlon from Arkansas. What covenants did God make with us? Well, there's the Abrahamic covenant. He renamed Abram to Abraham whereby Abraham is the father of many nations. And, and that's why that Abraham is a blessing to all nations. Why? Because Christ would come through that family. 
God, uh, through Israel, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through him would come salvation to all nations. That's ethnicity and every form. The children of God could find salvation from even Satan's overthrow for having worshiped him in the first earth age to standing against him in this one and earning the right to have eternal life in the third earth age. You can read of all three earth ages and heaven ages. We only have one heaven and one earth, but we have three different ages, eons of time. And you can read of them in 2 Peter chapter 3, all three of them. Mildred from Texas, if a person has dementia, does God take that into consideration? Of course he does. Anyone that is handicapped, God, God, our Father is a loving God. He, he you know, when, when you see what he puts up with, uh, there, there's, I just quoted 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me quote a verse from it. It says, God is long-suffering. I mean, he's got lots of patience. And it is his will or wish that all come to repentance, that they get their act together. They won't, but he's given them the opportunity, and it is his hope that they will. He's not going to force them. they got to do it on their own. And uh, he hopes that all will come to repentance, and so it is. He's, he's a loving father, and he doesn't wake up every morning and say, I wonder who I can zap today. He wakes up and he wonders how many he can, that will accept him and be saved that day, and how he can bless someone, how he can help someone that is deserving of it. And, um, and so it is. Elisha... El Alicia from California, is there anywhere in the Bible that has a specific dinner prayer? Not, not really. You know, I don't like written prayers. And you know something? Our Father doesn't really care all that much about them. Maybe, maybe when Christ fed the multitude, he, first he had an order. He divided them up in groups of 50. And he said, I want you to divide up and make them sit down in order. And then he gave thanks to our Father. It's from the heart. All you do is that dinner prayer is to say, ask him to bless the food you're about to partake of. I mean, we got a lot of pollutions in the world today. Ask him to bless it and uh, purify it. And whatever you're doing that day, ask his blessings on that. Just talk to him. Prayer is simply talking to our Father. He hears you. And he would a lot rather have you speak to him from his heart rather than have you read something somebody else has written. That, that would be like if you were, um, Eloise, if you were courting somebody and you got a letter from them and they didn't even write it, they had somebody else write it for them, would that letter carry that much weight for you? No. The way when you knew it was in that person's handwriting that you loved, it was from them, and it was their heart speaking to you, then you appreciated a lot more. Well, so it is with our Father. Don't you don't need a written prayer. Talk to him. Just, just he's so understanding, and that's what prayer is. And always pray to him, but ask it in Jesus' name. That gives credentials that you're a Christian. Curtis from California. When the fallen angels come to earth, did they impregnate Adam's daughters or Noah's daughters? Well, the Noah's daughters were, he, Noah's family was the only family, he, his sons, and their wives that still had a perfect generation. You can read this in Genesis chapter 6. When you break that back to the prime, it means progeny. It means their generation and pedigree was pure, pure Adamic. Adamic means ruddy complected. They had not intermixed with the fallen angels. It was, um, it was the offspring of Adam's daughters 
that they impregnated, but Noah's family was pure. That's why he was saved. You know, many people don't understand teaching against this is what caused um, um, one to be raptured or God knew him and just took him. And you can find in the great book of Jude where he was taken, Enoch was taken because he preached against this. And he, he naturally, he wanted the daughters of Adam to stay with the, with the, the Adamic family. But they mixed with the hybrids, and that uh, brought about the flood of Noah's time. Uh, Alex from Arkansas, will a man go to hell for divorcing his wife or wives, no matter what the reason? Please document. Well, I'm, I'm not the judge. God is, okay? But uh, if you're a Christian, you know that if you were the reason and the cause of these divorces um, and, and you repented, would you be forgiven? Can you tell me in the Bible where it says that divorce is an unpardonable sin? I can answer it for you. You can't because divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. They are sins forgivable. End of question and end of time. I'm out of time. Thank you all for studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I love you for that, but most important, God loves you for it. Why? It's the letter He sent to you. And when you read it with understanding, it makes His day. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and listen good now. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is good, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.